Hello, I'm Joe Schwab from Mass General Hospital in Boston, along with Ilya Laufer from New York University in New York City. And we're going to be talking about controversies in the management of primary malignant tumors of the spine. A bit of background, when I'm talking about primary tumors here, I'm particularly talking about chordoma as the most common primary malignant tumor of the spine. Uh, historically, chordomas were treated intralesionally. I'm talking before MR, before CT. <clears throat> and those patients, unfortunately, did very poorly. And that led uh, Bertel Stenner from Sweden to start taking these tumors out on block or in one piece, particularly in the sacrum. Um, and, and this, of course, is associated with a fair amount of morbidity. Patients often will lose bowel, bladder, and, and sexual function. Um, and over time, uh, patients were naturally looking for an alternative to surgery. And radiation, particularly proton radiation or carbon-based radiation, and now stereotactic radiosurgery, um, have started to be used more and more often in combination with surgery or as a standalone. And what we're going to be talking about today is the role of radiation, when to use radiation, uh, whether to use radiation. Uh, Ilya, I, was, I wanted to ask you, uh, in terms of the management of, of a, a primary chordoma, whether it be in the sacrum or the spine, do you use radiation at all, or and how do you use it in your practice? So we use it pretty consistently. You know, I think uh, the first thing I'll say is I, I do agree with you that I think the most compelling data are in favor of uh, wide margin surgery and, when possible, on block surgery for primary tumors. And I think uh, there's a wealth of uh, surgical data that show that when that's feasible and it can be accomplished uh, during the operation, we have the best outcome in terms of uh, uh, local control and survival. However, there are many tumors that are not particularly amenable to that, and uh, even if they are, perhaps might uh, pose some very challenging uh, decision points in terms of morbidity, as you outlined, and uh, uh, the risk of uh, potential complications and recurrence, for that matter. Um, and so as the probability of uh, local control perhaps goes down and uh, the possibility of uh, uh, perioperative complications and long-term complications goes up, I think we are forced to start thinking about alternatives to the surgery that can be quite morbid. And, you know, I think that's an area where there's been a lot of interest in developing the role of uh, uh, radiation, radiosurgery. Uh, the techniques of uh, radiation delivery have evolved greatly uh, in the last decade or so, perhaps. And so now we have uh, many more instruments in our tool belt. And, you know, I think at some point we should, uh, during this conversation, we should also discuss the role of systemic therapy as well that's emerging and uh, perhaps in combination with radiation. Uh, so what is the current role of radiation? What are the data uh, out there? You know, I think uh, uh, probably the most aged data would be around proton therapy, uh, and I think it's been quite compelling. You know, some of the work at MGH is probably, you know, the, the strongest evidence for the utility of proton therapy in the uh, control of chordomas. Uh, in combination with surgery or as definitive therapy when uh, uh, the tumors were deemed inoperable. And uh, uh, the radiation oncologists and the surgeons, the physicians at MGH have been able to show that proton therapy can provide quite durable local control. Uh, there is some morbidity associated with radiation as well, of course. Uh, you know, there could be significant skin toxicity uh, and, you know, some toxicity to the surrounding structure such as uh, the nerves, the plexus, uh, so sometimes people lose function with radiation as well. Um, the uh, evolution of that, uh, probably the next uh, two things worth mentioning would be carbon ion therapy, not currently available in the United States, but in Japan and Europe. And that's even heavier particles that are being used to treat chordomas. Uh, and they're perhaps uh, providing even uh, more energy delivered to the tumor and maybe better local control. I think that story is developing, but again, you know, I think uh, some of the data are quite compelling. And then the use of uh, stereotactic radiosurgery or stereotactic body radiotherapy, or SBRT as we're calling it nowadays. Uh, that's the use of photon radiation uh, for very high dose focal radiotherapy. Um, and uh, a lot of the data uh, for the use of SBRT emerges from uh, Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center. Uh, where uh, chordomas are frequently uh, treated with uh, very high doses of single fraction radio surgery. And uh, once again, the data can be quite compelling uh, around surgery in combination with surgery or in some patients who opted for this to be definitive therapy as well. Um, it actually started with uh, uh, SBRT being offered as neoadjuvant therapy, meaning uh, therapy to be delivered before surgery. And then some of the patients said, well, if my tumor is not growing, perhaps we can go to going through surgery, and these patients uh, have been followed for several years in some instances without uh, 
evidence of uh, tumor recurrence. Yeah, I think it's a, it's a very interesting point. A lot of great work has been done at, at uh, Sloan Kettering regarding this. I think a, a point about follow-up that you mentioned is, is so crucial, and, and so many studies have shown this, that um, five-year survival and five-year treatment outcomes can look quite compelling, but chordoma is unique in many, many ways, and one of the things about uh, chordoma is that they can come, it can come back um, uh, very late, you know, after 10 years, 15 years. And so uh, everyone's data in this arena will, will slowly decline over time. And so this is, I don't know that we, any of us have the answer, and that's again why we, we, have, we have these controversies. But do you, in your, in your current practice, do you use radiation before surgery? If you're going to combine it with, with surgery, <clears throat> do you use it before surgery, after surgery, or both? So uh, I think the protocols that we've been following uh, mainly are around surgery followed by radiation. Um, you know, uh, I don't have much experience with preoperative radiation in the setting of chordoma. Uh, I, uh, you do, uh, so perhaps, uh, you know, I hope you can answer that, uh, talk us through this question as well. But, you know, I think uh, even with low-dose radiation in the preoperative setting, we always worry about the potential uh, difficulty with wound healing and perhaps uh, scar formation that might happen and make the surgery more challenging. So uh, the applications that I've actually participated in and... Uh, and uh, used are around surgery followed by SBRT or even SBRT as definitive therapy. Uh, and uh, I don't have much experience with intentional preoperative radiation. I have some experience with failed radiation that requires yeah. surgery. Well, we, we, as you point out, we do use preoperative radiation at Mass General. And, and uh, one of the reasons is when we look back at our data, again, retrospective data, it, it turns out that when we have t delivered radiation preoperatively versus only postoperatively, the patients who were treated preoperatively had better local control. Um, and we, we believe that that has something to do with the, the what are called skip metastases um, that are outside the main mass of the tumor. Um, and, and if you give the radiation, this is our argument, if you give the radiation before surgery, you know where the main mass of the tumor is, and you know pretty much where these skip metastases are more likely to be, and it's easier to treat those with radiation in that setting. If you go in and operate first, in our view, um, you don't know where those skip metastases are. You can obtain a negative margin, and you've gone through this area where the skip metastases might be, and they may be anywhere within the surgical field, it's more difficult to target them. <clears throat> Again, this is retrospective data. This is our argument. Um, but not everyone agrees with this, and part of the reason is because you do have wound complications. I must say that the, the utilization, particularly in the sacrum, of rectus abdominis flaps or rotational flaps uh, in the thoracic spine have helped mitigate the risks of, of wound complications. But we still really deal with uh, bone complications. Um, particularly in the spine, we, we have a, a significant problem with uh, our bone, the bone healing long term. So patients can recover, but six months down the road, year down the road, year and a half down the road, the screws will loosen up, you have a non-union, you have a, a broken hardware, and, and that is actually one of the biggest problems in our practice now. Well, perhaps to follow up on that, uh, I think you've been one of the proponents of using vascularized uh, grafts uh, for the use of that, uh, you know, you have a lot of experience with that. Maybe you could uh, talk through that and uh, how that's changed. Yeah, that has, and, and we we have uh, we do use vascularized grafts uh, exclusively now when we're when we when we need to do a reconstruction, pr uh, principally in the spine, <clears throat> and that started with vascularized uh, fibular grafts um, as a standalone. Um, we've now gone towards moving the vascularized fibular grafts and into susceptible them into femoral allografts. And the reason is, especially in the lumbar spine or at the thoracolumbar junction, many of our vascularized fibular grafts were breaking. So now we put them inside of a, a, a femoral allograft, <clears throat> and we haven't had the same problem. We've evolved a bit into the thoracic spine, where we now use rotational rib grafts. We'll either rotate the rib and use it as a posterior uh, fixation with a cage in the front, or we'll rotate the rib down and put that, indeed, inside a femoral allograft. Um, and so our practice really has evolved, and that's principally because of our uh, issues with bone healing. And it really has helped quite a bit. I think our non-union rate, it's, it's, uh, it's not zero, but it's certainly much less than it was. I think another critical point to, around the use of radiation uh, for chordomas is the additive dose. You know, and I think that oftentimes used to get overlooked when uh, people were studying this question and looking at uh, their results. Uh, you know, I think we all uh, agree nowadays that uh, when insufficient doses of radiation are given, you know, uh, that's clearly a failing strategy for treatment. So delivering a high dose of radiation one way or another, whether it's an addition of preoperative and postoperative, whether it's uh, protons or SBRT, but, you know, delivering something that's going to be truly 
as close to ablative as possible to the tumor is very important. And you know, I think that's where a strong radiation oncology program and collaboration between the surgeons and the radiation oncologists is critical. Yeah, I totally agree. The, the way I describe it to people, if you if you try to do uh, a part a part way approach, either with surgery or with radiation, it's sort of like crossing the street halfway. That's really where you get hurt. You you have to make the decision, and then you have to cross the street. And and I think you have to use a full course radiation, a full course uh, a surgery, uh, or a combination thereof. Uh, you know, I think another question that gets asked, you know, let's say you're dealing with a tumor and you're planning for surgery, or do, do you plan for preoperative and postoperative radiation for every single tumor that you treat, or are there specific ones that you think really require it, or and certain ones where you think your surgery is sufficient? It's, it's rare that we, we, we don't do pre- and post-operative radiation just because our, our results are, have turned out to be better, even with negative margins, when we've used pre-operative radiation and then full course 70 uh, gray of radiation. There are cases where we have a, a really widely negative margin, but that's pretty rare, I, I would say. Yeah, quite fair. I mean, you know, I think uh, in my experience with SBRT, you know, we feel that the toxicity profile most of the time is quite favorable when the tumor is small. If the tumor is large, I think it's just even a more compelling argument to use radiation in any case. So, uh, you know, in my mind, I think there's a role for consideration or utilization of radiation in most of these tumors as well. There's a lot more we can talk about on this subject, but uh, given the time, I think we've covered a lot of uh, interesting aspects of these controversies, and we hope you found it interesting.